The sunshine and beaches of South Florida attract many types of people. Aspiring young models gravitate here with the hopes of being discovered. Beginning in February 1984, the dreams of stardom darkened into nightmares when several young women disappeared. It was the beginning of a string of brutal and terrifying murders that spread out across the country. It's a model's job to rivet the public's attention. But in 1984, some aspiring models began attracting publicity in a terrible new way. Across the country, dreams of glamour turned nightmarish as young women disappeared, only to be found tortured and killed. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. When a suspect emerged, the FBI's 10 most wanted list became the tool we used to try to flush him out. The promising life of Beth Kenyon came to a violent end on March 5th, 1984. The attractive 23-year-old dreamed of becoming a model. She had even been a finalist in the Miss Florida pageant. But all her hopes were cut short this Monday afternoon. Next day, Beth's parents reported her disappearance to the Miami police. The police merely listed Beth as a missing person and explained many girls her age drop out of sight for various reasons without telling their parents. But the Kenyans knew their daughter wasn't the type to just vanish after a few days on a lark. No, they hired private detective Ken Whitaker and his son, Ken Jr., to investigate. Yeah, she's been missing. Uh, the Kenyans Beth told the Whitakers that Beth days. worked as a teacher of emotionally disturbed and children. She, has a regular routine that she, comes home. So she was yeah. responsible and enjoyed a close relationship totally with her family. This is, as you can see, where she had a six o'clock appointment. Mm. Fearing something had happened to Beth, the Kenyans had searched their daughter's apartment in North Dade she's County for anything that might help them find her. But all they found was an address book is, and a picture this album. Beth, and this is Beth over here. And this is a, a, a boyfriend, somebody she went out with. Yeah, this is just showing me a picture. Armed with little more than a few snapshots of Beth and her friends, the investigators went to work. The father and son team quickly narrowed down Beth Kenyon's last known whereabouts. Ken Whitaker Jr. talked to an attendant at a Miami gas station near the school where Beth taught. Ken showed the attendant several photographs. He clearly remembered Beth, but he also recognized someone else in the photos, a man that accompanied Beth the afternoon she disappeared. His name was Christopher White. On March 11th, six days after Beth's disappearance, the investigators contacted Wilder by phone. He denied knowing where Beth was, but invited the Whitakers to his house to speak more about her. But when Wilder didn't answer his door, the suspicious investigators decided to look around. They had learned he was a successful building contractor and a self-proclaimed fashion photographer. The Kenyans had told the father and son team that Wilder had proposed to their daughter, but that she had turned him down leaving him upset and angry. Rifling through the garbage, the Whitakers found a photograph. Chris Wilder. On the surface, it appeared an innocent picture, but to trained eyes, it meant more. In 
Investigators soon learned that Christopher Wilder had driven a car in the Miami Grand Prix. On February 26, 1984, he finished 17th and won $400. That race day was also the last time that anyone saw Rosario Gonzalez. The 20-year-old worked for a marketing firm distributing free aspirin samples at the Grand Prix. The Miami News still buzzed with the mysterious disappearance of Gonzalez. She had vanished just five days before Beth Kenyon. The investigators discovered that Wilder knew Gonzalez. She had modeled for him in amateur photo shoots. It was a critical connection. The two missing women, Beth Kenyon and Rosario Gonzalez, were linked through Christopher Wilder. With this information, Mr. and Mrs. Kenyon sought the help of the FBI. Special Agent John Hanlon of the FBI's Violent Crimes Unit in Miami remembers the meeting. On the 12th of March, the Kenyons came to the FBI uh, seeking more active involvement of the FBI. Of course, we didn't have any jurisdiction at the time. There was no evidence of an abduction. In an attempt to put pressure on Wilder, the Kenyans' private investigators leaked their findings to the Miami Herald. The story was published on March 16, 1984. Though the article did not mention Christopher Wilder's name, it clearly accused him. The report described the man connecting Gonzalez and Kenyon as a local contractor, race car driver, amateur photographer, and a native Australian. It was Wilder to a T. Although the FBI had no jurisdiction, Supervisory Special Agent Gordon McNeil had already begun looking into the matter. This connection uh, drew my interest, and uh, I decided to uh, open a preliminary kidnapping investigation to see if we had a possible violation of federal law. Agents McNeil and Hanlon found Wilder was a likely suspect. He had a criminal history that reached back to his native Australia, where he was out on bail on a sexual assault charge. Days later, on March 21st, the agents were notified about an incident which allowed them to open a full investigation. A phone call came into the Miami FBI office reporting that a Tallahassee, Florida woman had been abducted and transported across state lines into Georgia, where she escaped. The initial description of her assailant fit Christopher Wilder. Are you okay? Special Agent Hanlon flew to Georgia to hear the victim's story. It was a nightmare. Oh, oh sorry, no business. 19-year-old Linda Grober told Hanlon she'd been shopping in a mall in Tallahassee, Florida, when a man approached her about a modeling job. Magazine covers? I got any number of really sound like Claiming to be a photographer, the stranger invited her back to his car to see his portfolio. It was the middle of the afternoon in a very public place, and Linda said she felt perfectly safe. Never? When he asked her if she'd ever modeled, she said no. He flattered her with remarks about how beautiful she was and promised he could put her on the cover of Vogue. But Linda reported that when they got to his car, the photographer began changing his story. He claimed he'd left his portfolio at his studio and he asked Linda to go back to the studio with him. When she hesitated, the man attacked and pushed her into the car. He clubbed her on the back of her head. Everything just went black. When she regained consciousness, they were driving on a country road. When her abductor saw her coming around, he stopped the car in a secluded spot.
He dragged Linda from the car, telling her that if she tried to escape, he would kill her. He wrapped his fingers around her throat and strangled her until she passed out. The next time she woke up, she was wrapped in a sleeping bag, lying on a bed in a cheap motel room. Once again, he threatened to kill her if she tried to escape. Don't move. He tied her to the bed and super glued her eyes shut. For the next several hours, the kidnapper repeatedly raped, beat, and tortured Linda Grober. When she disobeyed his commands, he shocked her with an extension cord he had fashioned into an electrocution device. Anytime the abuse was so severe, Linda realized she would be dead before someone found her. She managed to break free and locked herself in the bathroom. Somebody help! help. She pounded Somebody on the walls help. and screamed for help. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Hey! Stop now! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it. I'm telling you. The rapist panicked, grabbed what he could, and ran. Agent Hanlon showed Grober a series of photos and asked if she could identify her assailant. It was absolutely no doubt in my mind. I mean, I'd spent hours with this person that that's who he was. And I just identified him as clearly Christopher Wilder. Now 35, a PhD candidate and a single mom, Linda Grober's fierce determination saved her life. It also made her a strong witness, ready to risk everything for her abuser's arrest. I was in the hospital for a week or something like that, and then I was, I had to basically leave the country while he was still a fugitive because they were concerned about my safety. They're concerned about my family's safety. As heinous as Grober's ordeal was, it had the value of catapulting the investigation into a federal case. Because she had been abducted across a state line, the FBI now had full jurisdiction. Christopher Wilder was now wanted for the kidnapping and rape of Linda Grober. And he remained the prime suspect in the disappearance of Rosario Gonzalez and Beth Kenyon. Uh, obviously now we had a uh, federal violation and we had every reason to put all the resources of the FBI into this case. Not knowing exactly where to find Wilder, a team of agents descended upon his house in full force. Kicking in the door, they poured in, ready to arrest the suspect. Clear. 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 But they found an empty house. Clear. All clear. All clear. Wilder had long abandoned it. All clear. He was on the run, days ahead of the federal agents. And every minute he remained free, put another woman in jeopardy. The desperate chase had begun. March 1984, FBI agents conducted a meticulous search of the abandoned home belonging to Christopher Wilder. Two women were missing and presumed dead at his hands. A third had barely escaped with her life after her kidnapping and rape. The agents needed something to clue them in to their suspect's present whereabouts. You like to decorate it. 
But before he left, Wilder had prepared his home for any investigator. The place had been manicured. There were basically no fingerprints left in Wilder's house. You're always going to find fingerprints inside a residence. It looked like everything had been totally cleaned. FBI and local authorities canvassed Miami and West Palm Beach. But no one reported having seen or heard from Wilder since he left Linda Grober in a Georgia motel. The FBI alerted police to keep an eye out for Wilder's car. They asked banks and credit card companies to monitor any transactions he might make. But informational systems in 1984 moved slowly. The leads trickled in and were usually too late for a quick response. On March 21, 1984, a sharp-eyed utility repairman in central Florida noticed something unusual in a shallow creek. It was the barely recognizable body of a young woman. She was later identified as 21-year-old Teresa Ferguson. Witnesses last saw her three days earlier, leaving a shopping mall with a man fitting Wilder's description. The autopsy showed she'd been beaten with a tire iron and strangled to death. The victim's profile and the savagery of the crime suggested Wilder. but nothing directly tied him to it. If it was the Australian contractor, the FBI agents knew they had a serial killer on the loose. One that had to be stopped before he murdered again. Agents continued to follow the suspect's trail. An automatic security camera photographed Wilder at a bank in Tampa. The bank records showed that he had emptied his accounts of more than $19,000. It was an ominous break. Their prey now had the money to travel far and wide. By March 22, 1984, Wilder was already in Texas. Witnesses saw him approach 23-year-old Terry Walden in the parking lot of Lamar University in Beaumont, Texas. Walden was a wife, mother of two, and a nursing student. Yes, I'm a photographer. My job is to nurse. Wilder asked her if she'd like to do some modeling. Make a lot of extra money. You sure you don't want to keep it going and think about it? But Wilder couldn't seduce Walden with his pitch. She politely declined. She had no way of knowing that she would soon see him again. While the FBI began its national hunt, witnesses later told investigators that Wilder had stayed in Beaumont, Texas another day. This time he went back to familiar territory to stalk his next victim. They have this one since 79 or 99. He visited the local mall shopping for a young woman no, to deceive uh, with dreams of glamour. You're taking some fashion photography? No, uh, no, I'm, no listen, uh, you don't no, have to sorry. No. I'm legit, it's okay. But no one succumbed to his bogus no. promises. No, sorry. That's fine, that's fine. After getting brushed off several times, he spotted a familiar face. It was Terry Walton. Hey. She had come to run errands after dropping her four-year-old daughter off at daycare. Are you interested now? Will you take the card and just consider? Terry again turned Wilder down. I'm sure you could. But this time, he wouldn't take no for an answer. As she left the mall, Wilder followed her out to her car. In broad daylight, in the middle of a crowded mall parking lot, Wilder attacked Walter. He knocked her unconscious and pushed her into her Mercury Cougar.
he grabbed his bags and drove off in the victim's car. Walden's husband reported her missing later that afternoon when she failed to pick up her daughter at daycare. But by then, it was too late. Terry Walden's body was found floating in a canal near Beaumont, Texas, a few days later. The police recovered Wilder's Chrysler a few miles away. An FBI forensic search of the car uncovered hair and fibers matching Teresa Ferguson, the young woman discovered by the repairman five days before. It confirmed what the agents had suspected all along. Teresa Ferguson had been Wilder's fourth known victim. McNeil and Hammond estimated that the killer was still at least two days ahead of them. Out of the Miami office, they broadcast a national all-points bulletin for Terry Walden's stolen car. Uh, every state police agency along the way, every state trooper who was out on that highway knew the car we were looking for. And unfortunately, uh, it's amazing sometimes you say, okay, well, he's in a purple car. We say, how many purple cars are out there? Well, it's amazing how many purple cars are out there when you're looking for purple cars. And that was the problem. We never knew at the time what license pl plate he was using on that particular vehicle. FBI teletypes clattered endlessly. Every field office in the country received page after page describing Wilder's physical appearance, his victim profiles, where he had last been identified, and where he was thought to be heading. The technology of 1984, however, could not keep up with the pace of his flight. There were so many leads on Wilder going back and forth all over the country. Every one of them went to all FBI offices for information that the FBI teletype system was backed up over 48 hours for about two weeks because of the volume of information that was flowing back and forth on Wilder. That left the Bureau with only one certain way to track Wilder. They had to follow the grisly trail of corpses he discarded as he ran. The next victim was 21-year-old Suzanne Logan. She was last seen shopping at a mall near Oklahoma City. A fisherman stumbled upon her body two days after she disappeared. The location of her disappearance and the manner in which she died all suggested one thing. She had died at the hands of Christopher Wilder. In this particular case, we had an individual who was kidnapping, raping, torturing, and murdering a woman about every day and a half. So uh, uh, there was intense pressure, as there should be. Slow technology and a fast fugitive hampered the FBI. But on March 28th, they got the break they had hoped for. Wilder checked into a motel in Rifle, Colorado, using a stolen Visa card. The FBI knew he had the card and was using it, but they had not been able to trace it until Rifle. In those days, 1984, they didn't have the uh, instant validation of your credit card when you walk into a hotel. They only called in uh, bills that were going to exceed $100. Uh, every motel that Wilder stayed along his murderous route, the charges were in the vicinity of $50 to $60. Perhaps from sheer boredom, the motel clerk decided to call in the credit card that night instead of waiting to mail it the next day. Instead of approval, the clerk received a phone number to call immediately. 
An early morning call mobilized the FBI's Denver, Colorado field office. At last, the FBI knew where the fugitive was. In the early hours of the morning of March 29th, four agents approached Wilder's motel room, confident that they had finally cornered the killer. Okay. FBI, search warrant! Go! FBI! He wasn't there. As swiftly as the FBI had responded, Wilder had eluded them. For some unknown reason, the fugitive had departed yeah, before sunrise. He's not in the hotel. It had been the best lead the agency had, and it failed. Once again, the exasperated task force had no idea of where the predator was. Yet they feared it was one of the dozens of shopping malls within a day's drive of Rifle, Colorado. March 29, 1984. In just three weeks, the Australian contractor Christopher Wilder had abducted four women and murdered three of them. FBI agents noticed a pattern developing in the campaign of violence. The killer kept his direction westward, and he had narrowed his hunting grounds to shopping malls. Eighteen-year-old Cheryl Bonaventura was last seen at the Mesa Shopping Mall in Grand Junction, Colorado. The FBI would later connect Wilder to her death. You had a man that you knew was on the prowl. You had a man who you knew as each day goes by that, that some poor soul in deathly fear of her life was dying in an extremely uh, uh, danger, extremely painful way. To get the word out, the FBI cast a wide net. Across the country, agents notified security officers and mall managers about the danger telling them to be on the lookout for the Australian. Investigators supplied malls with photos and flyers that were posted to alert shoppers. Despite the FBI warnings, a teen magazine held a cover girl competition at the Meadows Mall in Las Vegas. Wilder showed up, armed with his camera. He chatted with several of the teens during the event, but eventually zeroed in on Michelle Korfman. The 17-year-old had driven up the 25 miles from her family's Boulder City, Nevada home. Nervous about participating in her first model search, she had asked her friends and family to let her go alone. After a few minutes' conversation with Wilder, Korfman changed her clothes and left the mall with him. Yeah, sure, I do. It was April 1st. As soon as Vegas authorities alerted the FBI that a local girl had disappeared at a mall, agents responded. They asked for all pictures that anyone had taken of the fashion show. One photographer immediately delivered five rolls of film. And when they printed those photographs, there was the Korfman girl on stage in a modeling type pose. And who's directly beyond her, about 20 feet away, looking at her with what I call the look of a homicidal maniac, none other than Christopher Wilder. Like the others, young Michelle Korfman suffered at the hands of Wilder. He bound and gagged her with duct tape. Then he beat, raped, and tortured her. 
and you will see incisions in the body. Uh, they may only be an inch to an inch and a half long, and they're not deep. They're done just enough to make it bleed. They were only meant to torture, not to kill, until he finally actually killed the victims. He was a brutal sexual sadist. On April 5th, four days after the Michelle Kaufman disappearance, the FBI held a press conference. They announced the placement of Christopher Wilder on its famed 10 most wanted fugitives list. For 50 years, the list has helped generate the publicity needed to catch violent fugitives. Hey, Special Agent Tron Brecky serves as national spokesman for the FBI. Okay. Thank you. The criteria for the top 10 was met with Wilder. He was a menace to society, he was extremely dangerous, a violent individual on whom charges were outstanding, and he had fled the area where we thought that he might be. Therefore, it was very important for us to get the message out to the American public and to the media that uh, he could be anywhere in the United States. But Wilder's addition to the 10 most wanted fugitives list came a day too late for Tina Marie Rasico. In Lomita, California, on the day before the press conference, the 16-year-old visited the Del Amo Fashion Center Mall to apply for a summer notice? job. What a beautiful face she the high school student wanted the work to save for a car. She met Christopher Wilder when he said that she was perfect for a modeling gig he had to shoot. And, uh, actually, you're so perfect that I could give you $100 right here. He gave her $100 cash and promised much more to come. If you're right, and I know you are, I can tell you all. <laughs> Do you have a few minutes to just go out and close the car? Take some pictures in. Say to myself, this girl is Wilder drove Tina Marie to a nearby park. At first, everything progressed as if it were a legitimate job. He said the scenic location had perfect light for the camera. As the shoot began, an eager Tina Marie worked to please her photographer. When Wilder told her to smile, she did. When he told her to tilt her head, she did. And then it all turned wrong. Now, in the car, all right? He pointed a 357 Magnum at her face and told her to get in the car. Quickly, quickly. The terrified teen had no choice but to obey. Wilder brought Tina Marie Rosico to a motel in San Diego. There, like all the others, he beat his teenage victim, tied her to the bed, and raped her repeatedly. Wilder cut her with his knife and electrocuted her using wires he would tie to different parts of her body. The brutality perplexed Agent Hanlon. You say to yourself, why would anybody want to do that to anybody, to scare them so bad, to brutalize them so bad, to, to torture them with an electrical cord, and then kill them like a, a piece of trash? And that person knows they're going to be killed. I mean, up until some point, the great realization comes over that individual, I'm not going to survive this. My life's over. And these are young women. He identifies himself as a professional photographer, commenting on a young woman's appearance and attempts to persuade her to accompany him from the area. Just as Tina's life was about to end, a special news bulletin captured Wilder's attention. And this approach may lead to his apprehension. Christopher Bernard Wilder has been placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. 
It was the FBI press conference. Wilder watched in horror as his picture was plastered on television sets across the nation. The federal agents proclaimed him the most wanted fugitive in America. They held him responsible for the disappearances of six young women. They didn't know about the seventh victim in the hotel room with him. We gotta move, come on. Wilder panicked. He grabbed Tina Marie and hit the road. Come on, we gotta move. But now that he was top on the 10 most wanted fugitives list, Wilder landed on the front page of every newspaper and on the top of every newscast in the country. It's the front page headline in every newspaper in America. Every news show, every radio show is talking about Christopher Wilder and showing his picture and saying his name, Christopher Wilder. The FBI hoped that by plastering Wilder's face across TV screens and newspapers, someone, somewhere, would spot him. It was the best chance agents had to stop Wilder before he destroyed another life. In the spring of 1984, the FBI conducted the largest manhunt in history for the rapist and murderer, Christopher Wilder. They knew of at least six victims, they suspected there were many more. Wilder had squeezed through the FBI net in Nevada as he headed back east. With him was a 16-year-old hostage named Tina Marie Rosico. On April 10, 1984, outside a shopping mall in Gary, Indiana, Christopher Wilder told Rosico that he would let her go on one condition. She had to help him catch his next victim. For six days, the adolescent had been raped, beaten, and terrorized. She was ready to do whatever he asked. Wilder noticed Dornette Wilt ducking into several shops. He figured she was job hunting in the mall. Rosico told Dornette that Wilder was a store manager and wanted her to fill out a job application at his car. When they reached his car, Wilder drew his pistol and forced Dornette to get in. Sweetheart, why don't you just come with us? Get the car. Get in. Go around. Go around. He sped off with the two girls. Witnesses saw them leave. A young woman, uh, very attractive, as were all of Wilder's victims, uh, had been taken from a, um, was seen leaving with an individual who they believed to be Christopher Wilder from a mall in the Indianapolis area. And so uh, when that information came to us, we felt that, okay, now we know he's headed back east. The Bureau directed every agent east of the Mississippi to work on the case. Despite his promise, Wilder refused to release Tina Marie. Instead, he forced Rosico to watch while he tortured and raped Donette in front of her. The nightmare continued for two days. On the morning of April 12, 1984, Tina Marie heard a familiar voice in the morning news. Any kind of energy and just put Tina come home alive safely. You know, we're all rooting for you. The word that we've got On national that television, has... Tina Marie's mother begged the kidnapper not to hurt her daughter. Is your daughter, and that there is every indication that your daughter is still alive. And... Wilder flew into another panic. He packed up his hostages get, get and left. Get her dressed, and you get dressed. Now! Wilder complained that it was only a matter of time before the FBI caught up with him. He stopped the car in a wooded area near Penyan, New York. He ordered Rosico not to move. Dornette was drugged with sleeping pills, yet he forced her to march into the forest.
Left alone, Tina Marie pondered the opportunity to escape. But the horror of the last nine days had broken her mentally. She stayed put. Walking through the woods, Dawnette Wilt slowly woke up to the realization that Wilder was going to kill her. She didn't want to die by stabbing. She begged him to shoot her instead. Ignoring her pleas, Wilder stabbed her through the chest twice and left her for dead. Fear that Donette Wilt might still be alive seized him. He returned to the scene to properly dispose of Donette. Stay here. You stay here. You hear? When he got there, he could scarcely believe what he saw. She was gone. Incredibly, Donette Wilt had survived. Stabbed twice, bleeding profusely, drugged and beaten, she had managed to pull herself up and escape to a road where a passing motorist rescued her. Thanks to Wilt's testimony, the FBI now pinned Wilder in the Northeast, still driving the Mercury Cougar he had stolen from Terry Walden. But for how long? After he went back and found out that she was no longer there, uh, he realized obviously that uh, he had to do something uh, with this vehicle. He needed a new vehicle. And uh, he got into Western New York State. Once again, he headed for the nearest mall. This time in Victor, New York, where he spotted a gold Pontiac Firebird. He told Rosico she would take the wheel of the Cougar and follow him wherever he went. He carjacked 33-year-old Beth Dodge. At gunpoint, Wilder forced her into the back seat of her Firebird. The emotionally shattered Tina Marie did as she was ordered. Wilder drove for a half an hour to a secluded area. Case, and I want you to get the camera, and I want you to put it in this car and wait for me, you understand? He forced Beth Dodge into the woods. Moments later, Tina Marie heard two shots echo out from the trees. There had been no rape, no torture this time. Wilder had simply killed Dodge for her car. But he had a different fate in mind for Tina Marie. In all the hell he had put her through, Wilder had bonded with Tina Marie. He told her he didn't want her to be around when the end came. He drove Tina Marie Rosico to the airport in Boston and gave her money for a ticket home to Los Angeles. Her ordeal was finally over. 
Once safely home, Tina Marie would fill in details for agents about Wilder's murderous rampage. Wilder was now alone. And the agents didn't want to wait till another victim disappeared to clue them into his whereabouts. During the search for Wilder, we knew that, uh, that he had uh, friends uh, in Canada and had visited Canada extensively. So uh, we felt there was a good chance that he was heading directly to the east and then north into Canada. Wilder raced toward the border in Beth Dodge's Firebird. For three weeks, he had beaten the FBI's best efforts. Even the 10 most wanted fugitives list had failed to produce his capture. Agents McNeil and Hanlon desperately wanted to stop the killer before he struck again or fled their jurisdiction. By April 1984, Christopher Wilder had left seven women dead across America. Three more were presumed dead. Three others had survived with rapes and beatings. The FBI believed that he was in New England, heading north. Federal agents concentrated their resources in the northeastern states before he could escape across the Canadian border. I mean, the FBI had agents out circularizing in the one in post or out and that kind of thing, but the best thing you have going for you are the hundreds of police officers up in that area who uh, are a lot, many more eyes and ears than FBI agents available in, in New England. On Friday, April 13th, 1984, Wilder stopped for gas in the tiny town of Colebrook, New Hampshire, about a dozen miles from the Canadian border. While he filled the tank, he casually asked an attendant about the paperwork that might be needed to cross the border. Two state troopers, Wayne Fortier and Leo Jellison, spotted Beth Dodge's car. They, like almost every police department in the country, had been told to be on the lookout for the Firebird and for a man of Wilder's description. Jellison asked Wilder if he could speak with him. Hey, buddy, Please, get out of the car. Wilder right. leaped into the Firebird and grabbed his 357 Magnum. In the struggle, the weapon went off. Officer Jellison was shot in the chest. He would live. But Christopher Wilder would not. The bullet that wounded Officer Jellison first passed through Wilder. It pierced his heart, killing him instantly. Wilder's cross-country reign of terror ended with a tenth death. His own. Authorities ultimately recovered the mutilated bodies of Cheryl Bonaventura and Michelle Korfman in the months afterwards. But the two missing women that started the investigation, Rosario Gonzalez and Beth Kenyon, were never found. Mr. and Mrs. Kenyon went to their graves without knowing the fate of their daughter. Other victims and their loved ones have struggled to restore their shattered lives. Are you my friend? <laughs> Linda Grober has also learned a chilling lesson. I think an important point to make is that these people are not always demons, and they're not, they don't always have tattoos, they don't always have long hair, they're often extremely eloquent, and they're, they're disguised and they can fit easily into your father's living room after dinner sipping a, a wine or a brandy. The terrifying truth is that Christopher Wilder was not unique. He made the most wanted fugitives list, but there are dozens of killers like him each year that never reach national attention. They trawl our shopping centers, our schools and our churches, searching for victims. Vivid dreams of easy fame and fortune can quickly darken. Only through public awareness, tireless vigilance, and the resourcefulness of the FBI can we hope to keep these predators at bay. <laughs>